If I if I may, may I invite all the speakers to um, hopefully turn on and share their cameras too, so that we can open up to question um, session as well. Sorry if we can um, mute in the background, that would be amazing. So fantastic. So we've had really eloquent talks. Thank you all very much. Um, and I'm sure we'll have lots of buzzing questions coming from uh, the floor. Um, it's I can't I can't really describe more how exciting it is uh, it is in this area. So perhaps we can kick off with a question from um, Claire. And um, so this is a question actually directed at you, Brian. Are there any signals to the patients who significantly drop their ejection fraction with the use of um, myosin? Binding, mice inhibitors and things. So um, what are there any specific uh, signals um, that require the inhibitors to be stopped? So uh, I, 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 I think the answer is we, you know, it, it is too early to have definitive predictors. I think a lot of um, emphasis has been put on the, the, the cytochrome P450 family uh, and 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 the specific one that, that metabolizes mavicamatin and and because the EMA have suggested that this is not a mandatory for prescription you think that this is going to be you know a, an important one in distinguishing who's going to drop their ejection fraction or not e equally you know if, if you do not uh, you know if, if you're one of the uh, people with with normal metabolism who the SNP is not relevant then you know I, I don't think we can say we don't need to worry about you yet because it, it, you know it, it is just too early so so I think every we have caution for everyone when we start it and we will learn more and more as, as more and more patients are prescribed it um the, the, the other thing to say is that apicampton has a shorter half-life we think we may be able to up titrate it quicker than mavicampton and it is not metabolized in the same way and it is not of the same drug interactions so you know whether, whether that will you know uh, be be more friendly we don't know um we have still seen drops in ejection fraction with apicampton in the small number of patients who've who've had it um are more elderly patients, you know, patients with ejection fractions closer to 55, patients with more fibrosis, you know, are they more likely to, you know, to have drops in their ejection fraction because they got more advanced disease possibly and 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 possibly we should have, you know, a bit more caution in, in using it in patients that don't have very, you know, hypercontractile hearts. And, and just uh, adding a little bit to that, how quick Lee, do you see the reversal in ejection fraction if it dips down? How quickly do we see upon cessation of the medication? How quickly do we see that ejection fraction improving again? Yes, yeah, so I think within a couple of weeks generally um, is, is, is what has been shown in the clinical trial. So, you know, I think that is reassuring, isn't it? Um, equally, I think a couple of the presentations in the Explorer trial, I think, were reasonably dramatic um, with the so-called stress cardamopathies. And, you know, I, I think you know, we, we have to try to learn and prevent those. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm confident that we will. Absolutely. Um, and there was another question actually from Stephanie, also directed at you, Brian. Um, so she was wondering if something like Mavicampton could be useful in gene positive, ECG positive HOCAM adolescence. Um, which I guess is the answer is yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, well, Stephanie, nice to hear from you. I hope you're well. Um, and um, yes, I, I suppose that's the big hope that we have. Um, and I think it's, it's going to be it, it, because there's a latent stage of the disease, and many uh, people who are gene carriers will not develop disease for many years or possibly even ever. Um, it's going to be difficult to show. Definitively, that Mavicampton not only prevents disease progression, but also improves the quality of their lives. But that's the big goal that we have. And, um, you know, I think that's the hope that we have. Yeah. So I guess that just alludes to the kind of genotype positive, ECG phenotype positive, but yet maybe echo CMR negative, if, if you follow. Um, so the very, very early stage that yeah. perhaps isn't overt at this stage, you know, I guess uh, we have to watch this space and see. Yeah. So one of the um, one of the real uh, challenges I I think about this is is as both Jane and yourself have have taken us through is the complexities here and and also Paz with the, you know, how do we 
remodel our services to 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 achieve both the therapeutic monitoring that's required for these therapies, but also to ensure that we don't miss deterioration when we have very swamped services, as we've if we've already talked through. And and Jane, you very kind of eloquently took talked through some of those pathways, which I think um, I'm sure there are a lot of keen people uh, listening to think about how they can revolutionise their own services. I mean, from a practical perspective, um, I think your your thoughts on the clinical scientist pathway or potentially a physiologist pathway is is really important um, so I guess for you Jane I had a, just a couple of questions um, and please everyone do pop some questions in the chat for us to to answer but for yourself Jane I was thinking so firstly what were the requirements for you to become a clinical scientist and also do you have the ability for prescribing or is that supported by the medical team alongside you because those are the couple of things that I'm thinking about the the pathway that you've defined which I think is a fantastic pathway what are your thoughts on that mm. uh, so for me I mean I've been in, in cardiology for about 18 years when I started I was called a technician then I was a physiologist and now I'm a scientist uh, so for me to become a scientist, there's an equivalence process um, through the Academy of Healthcare Science and you have to prove uh, how long you've been working and your experience and you have to be uh, accredited within your specialty field uh, and, and, and just prove that, that you are capable and knowledgeable enough to be looking after patients. Uh, for people who are just joining uh, the profession, there, there's a a master's level program which takes you through all of the qualifications and you get your BSc accreditation as part of the, those teaching um, programs. Uh, so prescribing point um, and it comes from the fact that physiologist has never been a registered a state registered profession. So at the moment uh, we can't prescribe um, but I think that is going to change in the next couple of years as everybody sort of moves on to the scientist program. Uh, so the way that we work that it, within the, the services that we have is the fact that they, they run alongside in your outpatient clinic next to consultant clinics. Sorry, I'm in a shared space. I got chucked out of a room. Um, so they they run alongside um, consultant services. So if, if there's an issue with prescribing or in, we can we can knock on the door and sort of just briefly interrupt a clinic and, and we get away with it through that perspective. But I suspect we will be able to go down the non-medical prescribers um, qualification within the next few years. So again, exciting times. And it just demonstrates the really multi-professional approach that we take in these conditions, which is so valuable and so critical. Um, and, and the expertise that you have from an echo perspective, you know, for, for the clinician and so those of us that aren't actually doing echo every day, your experience in echo is far, far more kind of honed in to the specifics um, which, from an echo perspective, which I think is, again, really complementary, um, really exciting. So over, I guess, um, Demetra, perhaps I can pass over to you for any questions, because I'm sure you have plenty of thoughts here. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, everyone. It was actually, uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, it's one of the talks. Um, uh, since we don't have any um, questions from the audience, uh, I would like to ask uh, Mariana, Professor Fontana. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the absolutely enlightening talk. Uh, it was actually a great overview of the pathways, the diagnosis, the treatment targets. Uh, and as you nicely show, showed us, the ATTR amyloidosis was the first attempt and real world hope actually of gene editing in a disease with such an epidemiological impact. Now, I would like to ask uh, in a family with uh, TTR disease causing variant, how would you approach the screening of the relatives with uh, positive predictive uh, gene testing in terms of follow up and um, yeah, thank you so much for the question. It's very topical because we receive more and more of these requests. And what we basically what we do is we start screening 10 years before the known presentation, because each mutation has got presentation of different age, B30 is very early on, V1 to twice later, around like 50, 60, T68 the same. So what we do, we consider screening from 10 years before the average clinical presentation. And uh, but these again might change because what's happening now is that some companies are thinking about doing prevention studies. Uh, so we're actually is mutation carriers in placebo controlled trials that uh, take the treatment and it's really time to and the endpoint is time to then 
evidence of disease. So again, one could argue that if an approach like that then becomes available, then maybe you should even start to screen earlier. But for now, basically, uh, knowing that, for example, a V1 to 2i patient, which usually presents in the 60s, uh, has got a mutation at 25, is really more problematic than actually benefit because it's got a huge implication for the family, psychology, uh, legal implication, uh, financial implication. So we really discourage screening until 10 years before the average clinical presentation for that specific mutation. And in terms of the test that you normally choose, is it the whole uh, um, spectrum? Um, yeah, what we do if if a if a person who comes to the center is just really for the family history, what we organize, we we have a video call where we do the counseling. And we send a saliva kit, so they don't even need to come to the centre. We send a saliva kit, they send that back to the saliva kit. If the saliva kit is negative, we discharge it. If the saliva kit is positive, then we call the patient back and we do the whole assessment, which includes echo, CMR, uh, CPIT, um, and a bone scan. Thank you very much. That was uh, really important. Thanks. Um, and uh, I have a, a question for uh, Pat that was actually lingering in my mind uh, when you were uh, presenting. Uh, in a race of uh, gene editing treatments, what's your guess of uh, the perhaps first uh, approval? Which gene do you think, uh, which disease is going to be cured with gene target treatment? Gosh, it could be any of the, the ones and and the pace which biotech is investing beyond just science, I think is is going to surprise us all probably. And with some of that biotech, some of the preclinical discovery science isn't available in the public domain, so we could get completely leapfrogged. But yes, I suspect it'll be um, the Duchenne, um, uh, the Duchenne efforts, you know, predominantly led by Eric Olson and others, um, or the HCM. And, and because they're very um, well studied disease models, so there are models to test and to scale up in. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't put it past biotech to, to leapfrog all of that. Goodness me. Actually, I was um, intrigued. Could we have a, a show of hands perhaps from the audience of, um, heaven forbid, one, you know, you had a family history of, say, HCM, for example, um, and uh, you could undergo gene editing. Could perhaps the audience raise their hands if that works on the system? Could we raise our hands to see who would be happy to undergo gene editing, given all of the uh, elements that have been approached today? Let's have a little uh, let's have a little um, check online and see how many votes we have for it. So lots of people coming in. I don't know for a panel. I mean, I think it's a really exciting, really exciting opportunity. Um, oh, goodness me, we are getting a lot of uh, hands up. All of these people else should know, though, that if they're the first to go, that it has implications for their participation in later trials. Remember, because of the AAB vector and your antibodies. So um, these are all things that the participants of current trials have to think about, too. So if you were going to um, counsel some, someone, Paz, on... Uh, their involvement and, and whether they should go ahead with the gene therapy. What are the key things, the key adverse things, again, just to summarise from your talk, the key adverse things that people need to be aware of? Yeah, so I think we're, we're still very early from, from us doing that in the clinic, but the things that I'm, you know, if somebody was approached from a, a research perspective, I think the things that you would want to know about are um, the extent of safety and efficacy data and which models and what's the duration of follow-up. Um, what is the risk of a sustained, sorry, the, the chances of a sustained improvement versus, you know, regression and off-target effects? Mm -hmm. um, and then how, you know, the immune effect, so how big a dose are you giving me and, and do you have to give me other medicines alongside that? You know, we saw, there was a case report published in Legend just the week before last, uh, DMD, um, tube therapy, and the patient had developed ARDS, it gives them an overwhelming immune response. So those are some of the questions that I would certainly want to know about. And then uh, does participating in this trial preclude me from future future studies as the field evolves? 
And I guess um, implications, uh, again, heaven forbid for, say, transplantation or um, uh, you know, organ transplantation in the longer term with the immunotherapy options as well is something that potentially may be a, 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 an implication, um, particularly for those with DCM or those that may develop burnt out hypertrophic cardiomyopathy over time and LV dysfunction. Mm, fascinating. So lots of hands have gone down. I presume that's that's a sit on the fence or whether people have just lowered their hands. Um, but I think that was a very kind of clear, you know, there's clearly excitement in this area. So um, I think fantastic. Um, so I can't see any further questions. So I think on that note, what I'd like to do is thank all our speakers. It's been a fantastic session so far. Um, we're going to just regroup for 15 minutes to give everyone a, a short break to make a coffee, stretch their legs, and then we'll rejoin at three o'clock. So thank you again to all our speakers and a round of applause, uh, certainly from a remote angle. So thank you all and thank you for our delegates that have attended so far. Thank you.